Chris Brown returns to the Plutopia podcast this time as we explore his latest book, A Natural History of Empty Lots, field notes from urban edgelands, back alleys, and other wild places. It is a kind of a love story with place. It's also just like a love story uh, about nature and about the natural world and about, you know, I'm just... Yeah, learning to connect with nature in a way that doesn't involve, like, you know, trying to inhabit some, you know, uh, gear catalog or, you know, goofy, you know, car ad of, like, imagining yourself in some remote, depopulated landscape that probably doesn't really exist much anymore in real life, right? And sort of coming to terms with it, like, oh, yeah, there's, like, a bunch of gray blue herons, like, making their giant nest there in this trashy tree behind this dumpy old warehouse down the street. Like, why are they doing that there? Could it be because there's nowhere else for them to go? Um, and, you know, getting excited about that and at the same time kind of saddened by that as you think about, you know, you as you wonder if, you know, the presence of a lot of these animals in the city is because they don't, they've kind of run out of other places to hang out. Hey everybody, welcome to the latest edition of the Plutopia News Network podcast. Our guest today is Chris Brown, who is an author, attorney, and urban naturalist living in Austin, Texas. And his newest book is called A Natural History of Empty Lots, um, referred to uh, in the blurb, I think, as a genre-defying work of nature writing, literary nonfiction, and memoir that explo explores what happens when nature and the city intersect. And uh, it's kind of an amazing book. I, I kind of got lost in it myself. Chris also writes science fiction, and uh, he's written several, which I think, I think we've discussed all of these here at the podcast from one time or another, I Rule so, of yeah, Capture. Yeah, Tropic of Kansas, Failed State. So how are you doing, Chris? I'm doing great. How's the I'm book just, tour? The book tour is just kind of kicking off here. I mean, I've got, I'm going to be running around Texas. I'll be um, uh, doing appearances at the Twig down in San Antonio, book people in Austin and um, and at uh, in Tarabang and then the Wild Detectives up in Dallas. And then it looks like I'm going to be going up to Portland and Seattle and maybe some East Coast stuff. And I'll be back here in Austin for the Texas Book Festival in November and uh, and then doing a oh, lot cool. of talking to a lot of folks on radio and on podcasts and and a lot of other media stuff. So, and it's fun. This is a fun, this is a really, is a very different kind of a thing. I mean, my last book was a, a dystopian novel called Failed State that came out in August of 2020. And it was a, it was a Philip K. Dick Award finalist, but it was about, you know, the post-revolutionary truth and reconciliation tribunal uh, trying to hold people to account for the destruction of the American wilderness. And um, and uh, it was a fun book to write and to talk about, but um, this is a really different sort of a thing. It's a nonfiction book telling a personal story and giving people um, a much more, I hope, you know, both simultaneously like truth telling a uh, way of thinking about and seeing wild nature around them. And at the same time, um, both practical kind of everyday guides for how to do that without having to like drive hours and hours into the country or make a long trip to a national park and hopefully tools to provide people agency to actually do something about the climate and biodiversity crisis and then instead of the sort of futile sense of waiting around for big institutions to do something that I think a lot of us feel. Well, the book only exists because of your life's journey being as it is. Can you talk about that a little bit about sort of how you got where you are at the point where this book, you know, manifests as a representation of, of how your life has evolved? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a big, it's a great question. It's a big question. Um, and without we got an hour. To, 
<laughs> <laughs> I mean, in essence, I mean, I mean, the book is uh, on the one hand, a, a, uh, uh, it embeds within it a bunch of anecdotes from kind of personal experiences out in the urban wilderness, but running through it is a, um, a kind of a longer form, you know, memoir sort of through line about, you know, essentially to get yeah, to your question, John, my own experiences of uh, interacting with the natural world in the course of a kind of, you know, pretty ordinary, you know, American life. I mean, middle class white guy kind of American life, right? But, um, you know, pretty ordinary. And, um, and it's sort of, um, it talks about, I grew up in the Midwest. I am not a native Texan uh, as uh, uh, non-indigenous people born in Texas like to sometimes call themselves. But, um, uh, and, and I talk about, you know, sort of growing up in the Corn Belt in a place where, you know, everything is green, but nothing seems alive, right? And, and, um, and about how, you know, as children, we all, I think, tend to have this sort of natural uh, impetus to connect with and to seek out wild nature, the sort of preference to kind of, you know, go see what's in the woods or, you know, find our own shortcuts through, you know, through the creek bed or uh, down at the end of the cul-de-sac and just that kind of urge to explore and see what we find and that sort of natural sense of wonder about other life when we can find it, right? It's often hard to find other than sort of, you know, commonplace birds and small mammals and bugs and whatnot. Um, and so the the core of the book in a way is about sort of being a young dad and um then figuring out ways to like uh do things with the kid that were entertaining for dad and the kid <laughs> and and um and you know at that kind of like cub scout age and sort of like hey instead of like driving for hours why don't we just go down here Let's like see what we can get find, you know, within walking distance of the house, see what kinds of nature we can find, you know, uh, in our little neighborhood and things like, you know, living in if this sort of periphery of the Hyde Park neighborhood of Austin and just like walking down uh, into a creek bed and seeing the insane monk parakeets with their multifamily thick and mud condominiums and the big arc lights over the intramural fields or the tadpoles, you know, sort of swimming around in the dirty creek behind the, uh, what used to be the state troopers like obstacle course <laughs> training facility back there off 51st street. Um, or, um, you know, eventually like discovering the kind of the stretch of the urban Colorado where in Austin below the, the dam that holds in the sort of downtown lake, you have essentially the natural channel of the river. And, uh, and so we started paddling down there and just being like, holy moly, you could get down in there. I mean, you have to navigate through, a, you know, kind of dirty little uh, uh, muddy area underneath the bridge to get into it. But once you're in the water, uh, or walking along it, you could you could quickly forget you were in a city other than the jets flying over on final headed into a nearby airport or the sort of distant sounds of traffic if you start paying attention. And uh, and so that experience of like finding out that there are all manner of pockets like that in every city, um, you know, these sort of so-called edgelands where in the liminal spaces between the heaviest human development uh, and uh, and the the land we're not paying a lot of attention to at the moment, you can find all kinds of uh, you know really intense experiences of wild nature, whether plants or animals, and um, and uh, and that and that experience can really fill life up with. Uh, a kind of authentic wonder. And when you have those kinds of experiences, it can really kind of help you get out of your own head. And so to, to try to take a long-winded disquisition and into a, an endpoint here, 
those experiences led me to sort of uh, start really seeking out those kinds of experiences, both with, you know, my family and, and solo. And uh, when I found myself as a, a, you know, bachelor in my mid forties, needing to find a new place to live, I ended up finding this rundown empty lot in East Austin that was like bisected with a petroleum pipeline that had been abandoned in place and just filled with big chunks of concrete and trash that people had dumped over the years. But, and it was like behind a bunch of like factories, but it was also near that river and near a bunch of urban woods. And so I embarked on the crazy project of building a little house there um, while renting a little house next door and, um, and learning how to go about the project of kind of rewilding domestic life, right. And restoring a little, uh, you know, acre or so of Blackland Prairie and just seeing and putting a green roof, uh, you know, a biodiverse green roof on my house and seeing how honestly, it's like easy it is to kind of bring back the biodiversity in the uh, fabric of your own home. Um, and from that, sort of learn a lot about the intersection of environmental justice of like the damaged relationship we have with the land on which we live and social justice and the kind of economic and social and racial and other problems that are sort of more dominant in the headlines, seeing how those things are connected and seeing how there were easy paths to activism in the community that I could kind of take some of these lessons I had learned and apply them to try to achieve meaningful change in a way that you know, applied that old kind of hippie or post hippie, you know, corny bumper sticker about, you know, think globally, act locally, right? And, 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 but it's, it's true. It seems kind of like a love story to me between a person and a place. You know, it's hmm. like you fell in love with this piece of urban wasteland, I guess you'd say, or at the edge, edge land, you know. An edge in space. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting way to think about it. There's definitely some of that there. Um, I mean, it's that's the place I kind of ended up, right? And um, it's kind of like, yeah, with other love stories, it could have been a different person, right? It's more about the idea of the kind of uh, the kind of relationship you want to build to build meaning in life. Um, but um, and I've explored a lot of places like this and a lot of other parts of the world uh, and lots of different, you know, kind of every city I go to, I find places like this. But yeah, making your home in such a place, it's a fundamentally different thing. And I have to say, you know, there's something about, I mean, there's something pretty special about finding a stretch of wild river that's like 10 minutes from <laughs> the downtown of the fastest growing city of Amer in America. That's like a, and a uniquely special kind of a place to find. And and nature in Texas is sort of in many ways more like abundant and intense and diverse than in a lot of other places. And it's kind of just more cool in a way. It's sort of, there's a lot more uh, uh, romance to it because so much of the stuff can, you know, bite you or kill you. It makes it a little more exciting or, or you know, pierce your skin in the case of a lot of the woody plants. And so, um, so yeah, it is, it is, it is a kind of a love story with place. It's also just like a love story uh, about nature and about the natural world and about, you know, I'm just, yeah, learning to connect with nature in a way that doesn't involve like, you know, trying to inhabit some, you know, uh, gear catalog or, you know, goofy, you know, car ad of like imagining yourself in some remote depopulated landscape that probably doesn't really exist much anymore in real life, right? And sort of coming to terms with it, like, oh, yeah, there's like a bunch of great blue herons, like making their giant nest there in this trashy tree behind this dumpy old warehouse down the street and like, why are they doing that there? Could it be because there's nowhere else for them to go? Um, and, you know, getting excited about that and at the same time kind of 
saddened by that as you think about, you know, you as you wonder if, you know, the presence of a lot of these animals in the city is because they don't, they've kind of run out of other places to hang out. Well, your uh, book spoke to my experience of moving back to Texas from uh, after 30 years in the Bay Area. And I lived in, you know, the East Bay, very civilized place, very, uh, very urban. And I came back to Texas because I wanted to get away from that. And I ex expressly told the uh, real estate broker that I used that I wanted to be in the country. I did not want to be in Austin because I'd already seen what <laughs> had uh, grown up there. And it wasn't the Austin I knew when I lived in Texas uh, in college. And I got a place in the in Bastrop County uh, that has nothing but trees around me. I'm surrounded by oaks. And I grew up in West Texas, and our biggest tree was a mesquite bush. And they weren't right. even any trees. So that made my life much more human, I guess. Uh, just being able to be here with wild animals around me. I have a deer herd that comes through daily, all sorts of wildlife. And uh, reading your experience, it, it really spoke to the whole need to be in a place that has more nature and less urban uh, sophistication, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I think that um, absolutely that being able to live surrounded by nature uh, will make it a lot easier to experience nature and to experience the kind of greater meaning to life and the greater sense of perspective and ability to kind of get out of your own head uh, uh, that just comes with having a little bit more biodiversity around you in your immediate environment. But, you know, and, but also part of the, and the take of this book is that you don't necessarily have to go to the country to do that, that there's a way to rethink how we live in the city that cultivates that, you know, and you can, you know, just like as simple as like people, you know, starting with people kind of rewilding their own yards, right? People trying to figure out ways to, you know, bring back more biodiverse vegetative environments in their, you know, in the classic American you know, single family home, uh, yard and garden. Um, and, um, you know, and looking at the sort of interstitial commons that still exists in the cities of all of the, you know, the lattices of rights of way and medians and, uh, you know, paths of infrastructure and empty lots and involuntary parks and, you know, places that can be, that are already places where nature just kind of comes back in ways that you can sort of cultivate it with more active intention. And you see things like that going on a lot of places. You see these like things like wildlife bridges that are being built in places like Los Angeles and San Antonio, where in areas of like sprawling urban development, people are figuring out ways to allow that to continue while at the same time, working to more actively create uh, pathways, literally, and kind of uh, uh, elements of habitat for wild animals, including, like in the LA case, this wildlife, you know, this like wildlife path they built over a freeway to allow these mountain lions who come down to mate from the mountains to get into town, right? And that kind of stuff, I think getting us all thinking about that stuff, those kinds of things more, uh, is, is, is critical. Yeah. And reading your book, there's a, a real sense of how colonization and industrial development can be potentially destructive. But if you get to the edges of that, you can kind of see things like coming back, like where, where you are right now, where you live right now, you're in an area that was formerly an industrial, um, uh, development and is now sort of being reclaimed by nature. And I don't know, when I read your book, I started feeling a real urge to figure out how to rewild, you know? Yeah. And I, I don't quite know how to do that, but, but it seems like that's the call to action. Totally. It is the call to action. Absolutely. To, you know, 
real wild, rewild uh, your own immediate environment. And maybe it starts at the hyper local, at, you know. I mean, I started experimenting with it on the balcony of a downtown apartment and, you know, the right after the financial crisis or right in the middle of the financial crisis, really. And then with this kind of dirty lot. And um, but I know lots of folks who are doing similar projects all over the place from, um, you know, I have a friend, uh, there's a science fiction writer named Matt Kressel, who has like rewilded this little <laughs> like pocket of uh almost like you know urban traffic island underneath the m train in queens and he's just planted all these native flowers there <laughs> every spring it comes up this little like island of beauty and biodiversity in the middle of the concrete jungle to you know amazing big institutional projects like uh in in munich they've taken kind of like a six mile stretch of the isar river which is the you know river that flows right through the heart of central Munich through the old the Altstadt the old downtown, and this was like when I was in my twenties. I remember going there, and you know it was like this kind of industrial canal almost. It had been like a really urbanized kind of classic European river. You'd walk over it; it always seemed really lifeless. And they figure out ways to like. Um, uh, one to just restore all the natural banks right to tear out all the concrete kind of flood controls um without giving up you know the kind of capacity to control it and like rewilded the whole stretch and figured out ways to limit the amount of filth that gets into it and now like you go there now like you go there in august or september it's just amazing and, like People run out of their offices at lunch or after work with like picnic baskets and swimsuits and jump in the river. And, um, you know, you get this sense of like totally wild nature in the middle of a major European city. Um, or in Seoul, Korea, there's a creek called Chonggai Chon, which is used to be buried underneath an elevated freeway that was kind of like mi migrating right through the central city and they daylighted it right they kind of tore tore out the they rerouted the highway i don't know if they buried it or rerouted it but um and then kind of regreened the uh the creekway and uh and the results are beautiful in between there's just lots of people doing wild yards and pocket prairies and you know at you know the institutional scale we have all kinds of projects uh in texas like the down at the headwaters of the comal and new Braunfels, where they've done this beautiful restoration or even like the there's a big green roof on the george bush presidential library up in dallas of all people and places go figure um i guess you know laura bush got her Lady Bird on uh, with that, but um, uh, and so on. And so, yeah, I think, you know, uh, the the we often talk about the climate crisis and global warming. We don't as often talk about the parallel crisis, which is the biodiversity crisis, which in many ways is much starker. And they're obviously part of the same thing and interrelated, but you know, according to the World Wildlife Fund, 69% of the wildlife population of the planet has been exterminated, has disappeared since 1970. And you just like, you just like wrap, you, 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 that, that, that statistic is so like bracingly um, shocking massive so hard to even like get your head around right it's just like and you think about it anecdotally you just think about like i mean you know um we all three of us i imagine remember going on little road trips in the 70s and like you couldn't in the summer and you'd you know get to your destination and look at the front end of your car and it would look like you had driven through a you know, a rainstorm of butterflies, right? And like, it's, they're just not there anymore. It's just, you know, you might have one, right? Um, which is a kind of gruesome way to think about it. And in a way, like, advancing part of the problem, right? But just like, 
that's like a horrifying imbalance like you don't have to you know be like you know binge watching you know koyana scotsy and its sequels to like find that to be a call to action right it's just like and so to me it, we need something akin to like a religious awakening around our connection to nature and our sense of like responsibility and stewardship and the way our sacred books purport to instruct us um uh, about how we take take care of nature and instead we're you know we're all wired into the machine which is all about generating surplus to support the human species which you know comes from nature in a way but comes from you know at, at its root the agricultural approach to the land of like controlling the reproduction of other species to create you know excess uh uh that can be stored and uh, turned into value for us and so that kind of our way to uh, a different path or at least a more balanced path seems like a critical one to me and so yeah absolutely this book is trying to by telling a personal story and giving people kind of some you know immediate ways to kind of start experiencing these things trying to help uh do what i can as one voice to try to um spark some of that kind of thinking and uh rethinking of how we live well when you started writing your sub stack uh, that came out every uh sunday it was my go-to thing to unwind after ha having read all the horror stories in my news feeds yeah. on sunday yeah. i could get some uh some relief of sorts because you always seem to come up with something that would make me feel better about uh you know taking a time to deal with uh, you know, rewilding my place. You know, you, you did in, in influence me to do that. And, you know, my neighbors hate it, but uh, I really kind of love having all this wildness around me. It's a really beautiful, um, beautiful feeling. And, and yeah, so yeah, oh, here it is. Yeah. So yeah, so Field Notes, this newsletter I started on the Substack platform back in, I started it in February 2020, right after I um, turned in the last round of editorial revisions on my last novel, and um, uh, and yeah, my timing was good, right? <laughs> this was just like a weekly dispatch from sort of walking around in urban nature, and this is where I had been accumulating all this material, and I was like, I want to do something with it, and I had always been intrigued, excuse me, by the newsletter format, and um, and and I used to like I used to write, you know, like a a column in my college paper, and that kind of that sort of I love the regularity of a, of something like that, and um, and so um, so I started, you know, yeah, publishing that every Sunday morning, and um, and when lockdown happened, I think that really it provided a a, a welcome kind of uh, different sort of reading and. And, and visual material because it's heavy on use of photography as well and that really was the the genesis of this um uh book was that newsletter and the response the you know wonderful response i got to it from folks like you scoop uh who um uh and really like all over the country and and you know all over the world i had I, it just sort of accumulated very quickly and it's been really rewarding and it's been so cool to you know uh see how eager people are for um kind of taking a fresh look at look look at the world and at the other life around them did your did your book draw very much from material you developed for field notes or was it pretty much a separate project it's pretty much a separate project. I mean, there's a couple of anecdotes in there that I sort of drew on the on things I had done about them for field notes. But largely, you know, I really I to me, it would have been a cop out to uh, just kind of like recompile stuff that is, you know, already done. And um, I needed to figure out, you know, I mean, writing you know, a thousand-ish words, maybe 1,500 words in a newsletter with a bunch of color photos. Um, that's a very different kind of format. And you, you, 
you don't have to have a whole lot of narrative structure to like hold people's attention that you can kind of like distract them with enough cool shit right so versus like you know and you know eighty five thousand word book with you know maybe some black and white photos here and there that's a very different thing and so you got to have a strong narrative through line or that's what i wanted to do and so i conceived of the book as um you know through a, a a proposal i sold the book off of a proposal on some sample chapters um which were new material um but the proposal conceived of the book is in kind of three key parts the first part is sort of this you know a guide to how to find uh, uh the wild city uh, the second part is about rewilding domestic life, uh, kind of through the prism of what we did at our own home. And then the third part is about taking the lessons from all these experiences to, to think about how you might rewild society um, or, you know, real, you know, expand the aperture. Um, and it gets a little more political, maybe, and a little more um, kind of community wide and maybe even, you know, global. And um, uh, but as I started writing it, so I had this kind of clear uh, structure in mind, but I still, I didn't have the, like, that was still kind of like, it sounded like an accretion of like information delivery chapters in the way of classic nonfiction. And I wanted to do something more, but I thought about it a lot. And I was like, you know, what kind of story is this? You know, it's like, uh, I wanted it to do some of the truth telling that like a good novel does while at the same time providing all that information. And then I kind of figured out, oh, I know what kind of story this is. It's sort of in the tradition of these narratives of like exploration and discovery and uh, colonization and settlement um, that are a really like deep and deeply internalized part of the American story, you know, both in terms of the um, the sort of books where we read, you know, in school of kind of like these kinds of stories of, you know, the settling of the American continent um, uh, and of the folks that preceded us here who all came from somewhere else, right? We all were, we're all nomads in our bones who walked out of Africa and kind of made our way across the planet. Um, and, you know, family stories. Every family has, you know, the stories of kind of, you know, you know, well, this is where we came from back whenever. And, you know, this is why we left. And this is how we got here. And this is what we found here. And, you know, uh, here's how we changed it. And here's how it changed us, right? Um, but a lot of those stories tend to be, um, you know, from a contemporary perspective, I think, lacking in a kind of a self-awareness of the colonial framework through which they're seeing things. And so, so I embarked on, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to write what's essentially a story of colonization of sort of one guy walking out and seeing what's out there in these unexplored or, you know, to him unexplored parts of the city and then making a home there and then trying to change it and how it changes you but do it in a way that's about you know how do you decolonize the world around you how do you decolonize just think about that your, how do you decolonize yourself right um and so it's like colonization with an awareness of of the issues of colonization you know it's like yeah. how do i how do i sort of colonize this space without the having the destructive aspect of of colonization as it has been practiced yeah and then you dig into it and this is like at a at a deeper level it's like from a social perspective you're trying to widen the aperture or think about how to yeah okay how do you really take the lessons you've learned and 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 apply them more broadly it's like how do you are there ways, you know, or are there ways we can, um, in a in a deep and meaningful level at the root, address the sort of design flaws of modern society uh, that are the root causes of our 
environmental crisis of our parallel climate, you know, warming and biodiversity crises without giving up all of the bountiful wonders of, you know, modern life, like, you know, art and literature and music and electronic networks and great health care that keeps us alive longer and access to you know food that keeps us healthier and alive longer and all that and and i don't know that i know the answer to that question because it's to me there's this you know the design flaw it's like there's a the the killer app of human civilization is the discovery of agriculture of like production agriculture specifically grain agriculture right and it sort of traces back to you know the neolithic and that's the origin of cities it's the origin of money it's the origin of basically math and written language and um and but it also has a you know it's it also it's the feature that's also a bug right because it's also like you can't have enough and it's based on this imbalanced extractive relationship with the environment and even if you're, you know, you can be all, you know, kind of get all back to the land, you know, micro farmer, subsistence farmer kind of thing. Um, and maybe that's a little closer, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of engaged in that. And so, um, so I'm trying to explore a lot of that material in the back end of the book. And it's sort of, you know. I didn't have space or I think, you know, the definitive answers to kind of go all the way in on that, but that's the, that's the trajectory I'm trying to take it to. Well, there's kind of a fascinating personal narrative there uh, that sort of starts with you showing up in Austin and going to work for a law firm and so forth and kind of looking around and starting to be aware of these spaces and the thing like, you and I've been friends for a long time and I've often, yeah. we've never really, I've never really been completely clear how you came to build that house. And now I have, you know, kind of the whole story in your book. And that's a thread that runs through it of you discovering this, you know, you find this lot and it's got an abandoned pipeline on it and you figure out a way to negotiate away the pipeline and the easements that were associated with it and yeah. actually get the house built. And I don't know, I mean, just in your own words, maybe you could say kind of what your goals were in building that house, which is really embedded in the land there. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of live in the Edgelands, as it were. I, I had found these spaces, right, that I thought were really meaningful, where like, you know, you kind of like flip through the fence behind the door factory, <laughs> like all of a sudden you're in the wilderness, you know, and a, the kind of wilderness where you can hear the sirens of the cops and the firefighters hurtling down the boulevard to get on the on-ramp to go to the emergency. And the coyotes in the woods, you know, equal distance from you start calling back to the sirens, right? Um, and, um, you know, a place where you can, like, get out of your car, walk down a little ways and to to this river right where it's coming out of the dam and watch some deer walking across the river. I wanted to, while at the same time being able to get back in your car and go to work or go to a movie or, you know, grab, grab a bite to eat, right? And so I wanted to experiment with trying to like make that part of everyday life right? Not just like a place you got to go to. It's like, okay, step one is like, oh, you don't have to drive to Big Bend to experience wild nature or to some other national park. You can experience it in your city, right? Or your town or your, you know, uh, you know, kind of acreage, you know, surrounded by ranches and farms. Um, and then like, oh, you can, um, uh, you could actually bring some of that life energy right to where you live like why can't you um and and in my case i did it in a way that you know it kind of um amped up the the regenerative aspects of it because it wasn't just doing it with a kind of regular piece of land it was doing with a seriously fucked up pardon my french piece of land right that had been 
you know, uh, ravaged by the petrochemical industry and by, you know, dumping and the kind of remains of, you know, uh, tearing up the city and, um, you know, and even that stretch of river, you know, I found it and I thought it was like some kind of intact remnant. And then I learned like, no, it was like 60 years ago. There was somebody, you know, let a bunch of DDT run off and it killed every fish from here to LaGrange. Um, such an extreme toxic event that it was discussed for a couple of pages in Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And, um, and so that idea of like, um, yeah, the idea of looking for a way to um, turn the immediate environment in which you spend most of your time into a place where you actively share your space with other life right? And try to encourage it, starting with plants and the insects that they attract and the birds and the lizards they attract and the mammals that might be able to come through and, and whatnot. And so, um, and I think, you know, I mean, and the project was a success, sometimes in ways that, you know, might be like, yeah, it's a little too much nature for me. I've had a lot of, I've seen a lot of like early reviews feel like, yeah, I don't need coral snakes, you know, by the bedroom door. Thank you very much. Or, you know, and I don't need, you know, Texas walking sticks fornicating on my, on my, uh, on my glass, you know, or whatever. Um, and, uh, but, um, and so, yeah, it's like all experiments, you have some un unexpected consequences, but it's been pretty wondrous. And, um, and so, yeah. Sharing that as a way to give people a sort of array of things to think about how they might be able to do it um, on their own terms, right? Uh, in their own circumstances, uh, to me, felt like a meaningful undertaking. Do you worry about uh, the success of Central Texas, the Austin area, starting to uh, creep into your uh, your magic kingdom there? Because my experience, you know, when I moved out here, it was so wild and nice. And now the, the various, you know, successes, you know, Elon Musk comes to town and now suddenly <laughs> the uh, place isn't nearly as cool as it used to be. You know, in Bastrop County, uh, they're just, you know, clear-cutting the forest and putting in new housing developments because... Yeah. All these companies are suddenly successful. So do you wonder about uh, how how long your uh, neighborhood is going to last? Oh, totally. I mean, yeah. I mean, we live in a place where, I mean, from the minute we found it, we're like, oh, well, this is really cool. I wonder how long this will stay this way. It's just like anything. I mean, things change. And, um, and, uh, and so... Um, you know, you know, it's ephemeral. I mean, an empty lot, right? You know, the book is the natural history of empty lots and that idea of the empty lot um, and what really is an empty lot and the irony that, well, in fact, actually there, there is no such thing as an empty lot. There's something there, right? And um, calling it empty is kind of from the perspective of the urban planner or the real estate developer, right? Or the capitalist. Um, it, the, it, it, the empty lot is a place that just happens to be kind of between two different land uses and, you know, there's something else coming down the road. The idea of, you know, in the city, the idea of protecting empty land from development, unless it's like in a floodplain or a toxic site or some other place that you just can't develop, um, you know that's a Quixotic undertaking, right? And you know the change is coming. And um, and and when you kind of accept that and you, um, you know, uh, have encounters with all this wildlife that's living in a place like that, you can just like, you know, the little family of foxes behind a door factory or whatever, or the barred owls kind of down there you know, hanging out under the bridge, um, you, you get filled with a sense of anticipatory loss. It's just like, yeah, um, it's like, oh, I finally found it. And then, oh, but it's not going to be around that long. Um, uh, 
but by the same token, um, there's hope, you know, you see it in the empty lot. You see how quickly, if somebody just leaves a piece of uh, land alone, um, nature quickly reclaims it. And um, there have to be ways you can both uh, allow for, you know, continued development to support a growing human population and provide space for wild nature. And that kind of figuring out how to, you know, make that balance of priorities a big part of the book. And I mean, I'm working on an op-ed now, right now for a, a major paper on this exact topic. And, you know, and in the United Kingdom this spring, uh, the conservative government before the most recent elections enacted final rules of a statute that they had passed previously that require that any new real estate development or redevelopment, other than just like one single family home, any kind of, you know, multi, multi uh, unit project of any sort or commercial project must demonstrate that it has achieved a 10% net gain in biodiversity after the project. And it's like, okay, well, wow. If the Tories can put something like that in place in the United Kingdom, um, a place where, you know, the erasure of wild nature um, has a much longer history, right? You know, just a much longer kind of colonial history there, um, you know, millennia, if you look at it from certain perspectives. And versus here, you know, like in Texas, where we live, you know, the I mean, agriculture didn't really arrive here until the 1820s, right? You know, sort of two, a short 200 years. And then maybe that, and we don't have real winters. And it's just like, that's why, like, you know, you forget to mow the ditch and the primrose and the blue bonnets and the fire wheel and, you know, you name it, all the wildflowers start popping back up. Um, and so, um, so there's hope. And, um, and and there's paths to find balance there, Scoop. And, you know, and, and there's kind of in a way to your point about like the new development coming where we are. Um, on the one hand, there's no easier way to get involved in activism that can have an immediate impact than um, showing up to for local real estate development fights because, you know, it's pretty easy. You can get access to the public officials making those decisions. They'll give you their ear, whether they'll be persuaded or not, I don't know. And the, you know, the rules are still stacked against you. Um, but here we've, we've had a lot. I work with, uh, I work with uh, Poder, the East Austin Environmental Justice Group founded by longtime East Austin residents who amazingly, you know, succeeded in shut, shutting down a leaking above ground petroleum storage tank farm in the nineties that was run by I remember the that oil companies and and now I'm working with them on you know conserving the urban river in Austin and we've had successful discussions with Tesla around their factory and about holding them to account to their um, CEO's declarations of the things he was going to do to kind of protect the river and the riparian corridor and we've had a lot of luck working with um, uh, you know other developers of local projects on trying to work out you know, kind of compromise deals that provide some protection for wild spaces while allowing development to go forward. And, you know, um, I'm hopeful, I, you know, so I, I it, it's never, there's never a perfect outcome. And, you know, I'm always, I, I don't want to drift into the, you know, the dark science fiction writer perspective, but I'm always kind of, you're like, well, spend a little time out in the urban wilderness and you can see that nature is going to do fine in the long run. Nature is always, nature has its ways of, you know, adapting and surviving. I'm, I'm more worried about us if we don't figure out a way to coexist with nature and trying to convince people of that. Um, sometimes you have to do it by appealing to the developer's sense of body, but bottom line and the idea that their, you know, consumers will be attracted by, you know, natural features nearby um uh, so you can have some luck in that respect but uh, preserving authentically wild spaces is harder 
You know, where I live, there's a kind of a cluster of subdivisions that surround a, a significant green space. It's, uh, uh, I think it's referred to as Bowerly Ranch Park, but it's like Slaughter Creek runs through it. Uh -huh. And uh, there's, n there's no development. I'm not exactly sure what the agreements were. I, I had, I believe there's some requirement that when you do a development like this, you have to leave a certain amount of green space, you know, or, or a certain amount of maybe not totally wild area, but this tends to be pretty wild. And of course yeah. we have, um, we have in our, in these neighborhoods, this cluster of neighborhoods, we have, uh, you know, we have possum and we have raccoons and there's a number of deer. There's quite a few deer. Um, I mean, it's a, we're we're somewhat integrated with the wilderness, but it's a very you know the the neighborhoods themselves are uh, you know there's HOAs and they require you to keep your lawn trim and that sort of thing, so you can really see you can really get a sense if you kind of wander off into that green space of the of this border you know this edgelands border the the edge of the wild, uh, yet there is a lot of civilization around here too. Totally. I mean, well, it kind of fascinates true. me. It is. I mean, yeah. it's. I think. I think it's true in most places. I mean, you're right. There are for these newer developments. There are usually requirements for uh, park set asides. Um, sometimes they can like pay money for land to be purchased elsewhere, kind of in lieu of setting aside their own land for that. But, but yeah, it's a it's a priority in most of the municipal codes now, and. Um, you know, and there are a lot of, you know, good news stories out there when you start digging into this material. I mean, they're, uh, uh, the eastern half of the United States has dramatically reforested over the past, you know, 100 to 120 years. And most uh, Americans now live, you know, within uh, kind of, you know, near distance of some kind of a of a feature like you're talking about a significant you know acre or more of wild foliage that um you know provides some amount of urban habitat and so um most of us you know unless we're in like a really intensely you know kind of uh, urban place like new york city or uh, maybe downtown chicago or whatever um, or living in, you know, sort of maybe the, you know, a really extreme, you know, desert landscape. We're around, you know, a pretty, uh, we're all living close to these pockets of, you know, wild nature, whether it's urban or suburban or, uh, you know, or rural. I guess part of and what we're dealing with is the fact, it was the fact that yeah. capitalism or hypercapitalism, you know, they, they see a wild space and they immediately start thinking how to exploit it, you know, how to colonize it. And that's the real problem is to like, how do we, how do we sort of undo that, that impulse or how do we, how do we struggle with it? I, mean, I know that there's people who just think that way, you know, uh, the assumption being that if there is a space of any kind that has any kind of value to it, we have to figure out how to extract that value. But sometimes the value is in not extracting, right? Yeah, I mean, it's deeply embedded in, even in our language and certainly in, 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 in what our language reflects about how we think about the land. I mean, in the, um, you know, in the, it's sort of like in the, you know, in the English language, the term, there's a, the, the term for sort of uninhabited spaces uh, uh, historically is, you know, waste, the waste, as in like the wasteland. Um, and, and on the one hand, etymologically, the word waste, you know, shares a root with the word vast, you know, it means kind of this like expanse, but it's an expanse without people. And it's not an accident that it's also the word that, you know, means to 
you know, waste in the sense to fail to realize value from something. And, um, and in the, um, you know, in an early American jurisprudence, you know, like in the, a lot of the early property law cases you read in law school from the colonial era, they talk about the judges will make kind of side comments or, or more direct comments about the idea of waste and wasteland and like uninhabited land and at the edge of the community. And there's always this suggestion that, yeah, it, it needs, we need to change that condition of it. Um, and, um, but, it, and in that colonial era, um, in this country, the, you know, and in colonial Mexico and Canada too, there was still a really integral role for every community of the commons of, you know, land shared by members of the community uh, and maintained collaboratively and maintained in a kind of quasi wild state, I would say, to provide, um, or, you know, wild or quasi wild to provide members of the community with you know, opportunities for hunting, foraging, and pasture. Um, and, um, and ironically, it's that the colonial era commons, which had come over from Spain and England uh, with the settlers, was sort of the main instrument of ecological destruction that sort of uh, pushed the native peoples of this continent, you know, further inland, uh, all the way to the end point that we know well, because uh, uh, pastoral culture with, you know, uh, cattle and hogs in the U.S. and cattle and sheep and uh, in Mexico, it would um, really destroy these kinds of, you know, previously ecologically bounteous hunting lands that the Native Americans enjoyed. Um, and so um, uh, kind of long winded way of saying, yeah, we we. We have a, an intrinsic cultural abhorrence of land that is not being put to use to generate surplus, right? Which is kind of the the that generation of surplus is you know that starts with grain agriculture and you know at the moment ends with you know maybe with you know cryptocurrency or something, right? Generated by burning up huge amounts of energy to you know. Uh, Hash uh, complicated uh, uh, mathematical calculations and computations. Um, uh, that's 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 the main engine of society, and anything that doesn't contribute to that is uh, highly suspect. And the only hope, just to kind of wrap it up, is there is the economists are finally getting good at working with the ecologists to start talking about this idea of like ecosystem services. The idea of, you know, of um, the ways that wild nature contributes to human wealth measured through the eyes of capitalists and, and you know, used in that language or in that mathematical language. There's a great uh, article recently about an example of such a study in, in India around the vulture population, where in India they started giving the cattle this, like, uh, medicine uh, designed to deal with diseases that were common among cattle. And the, the medicine, though, uh, was deadly to vultures when they would eat the carcasses. And so the vulture population in India was decimated. And they concluded that, like, I don't know, it was like a half a million lives were lost over a decade because human lives, because of the loss of vultures, because of what they were doing to regulate the spread of disease and even to, like, mitigate automobile accidents because they're like clearing the carcasses off the road and there's a bunch of other examples like that out there so hopefully some of that will help people start um thinking differently about it but you know you shouldn't have to we shouldn't have to economically um model that stuff out to start caring about nature i was just thinking about the concept of an empty lot, you know, an empty lot is never really empty, right? Yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. There's no such thing as an empty lot. Yeah, it's only empty for the people who would like to put a house there, I guess. You put a house or a, you know, a multifamily, you know, project or a 
an office building or a factory, uh, you know, a yeah, music all, club. All of this uh, development and uh, progress uh, depends on the availability of water. And that's become a real problem. And uh, I, I don't see it getting any better, not just the availability of water, but clean water. And uh, if that goes away, then all of these businesses and agriculture and human life is going to go away. Yeah. I mean, there was a thing in the paper about it today, about the, the you know, extreme, even like our Texas Agriculture Commissioner that, you know, yeah, who's Sid Miller talking about acknowledging what a crisis we have with respect to water, especially right now down in the Rio Grande Valley. And <clears throat> you look at things like groundwater, uh, you know, on a global basis, and we have sucked so much groundwater uh, from the aquifers of the planet that it has caused an observable tilt in the axis of the earth. Right? And that's like just yeah. in the past, you know, century. He's like, okay. We have we have we reached the end that. of our hour, and I'm just sitting here thinking yeah. about there's a bunch of things in my head I'd like to talk about. One of the th <laughs> one of the things I was thinking about was how the bits from your you know from your computer feeding into the Zoom feed are coming through an ant colony. I know that because I read your book, and that's pretty yeah. fascinating. Yeah, but we have run out of time, and I, you know, you should come back. We should talk more about this in the yeah, future. All right, well, let's I, do it. Yeah, it would be. I'm fun. feeling kind of fired up. I'm wearing my right. uh, Millennium Whole Earth Catalog T-shirt here uh, that I got. You know, that was what quite a few years ago. I, I think it was in the '90s that we did the Millennium Whole Earth Catalog. And the whole Earth catalog is no longer here, and, and its publications are no longer here. But um, as I read your book, I sort of remembered the things that I used to read there. And uh, I feel that I've had a, a bit of a void myself. And I think that, uh, in general, there hasn't been anybody really sort of evangelizing for the, the idea of uh, well, the term you used, rewilding, is a good way to put it. And uh, I think your book is, is a powerful statement in that regard. Thanks, John. Yeah, I hope so. I mean, you guys are old enough to remember the ecology flag. It used to be. Right, right. When yeah. It was like I'd see it everywhere when I was like yeah. a kid. It's like, and I, I don't know, it's still, it's still kind of there and, uh, in my mind as a, you know, a banner to carry. And so, yeah, I appreciate your help trying to get the word out because I do think we need we need a kind of mass awakening and one that's a little different than like acknowledging climate change. It's a much deeper thing about acknowledging other life around us, learning how to each connect with it and figuring out how we can, uh, yeah, make room for it in our own world and learn to share the space we have. Yeah, I remember when, uh, celebrating Earth Day was considered a radical move. It may still be. I think, uh, I think I'll see if I can find one of those ecology flags and fly it as an alternative to our neighbor's Trump flag. <laughs> totally. There you what go. You? They won't even know what it is. They'll be, what country is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And yeah. um, we'll look forward to seeing you at Book People, among other things. Yeah, see you at Book People. All right. Awesome, guys. Okay. Thank you. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future.